Today's guest on Crystal Storytellers Podcast is a man who's played a wide range of unforgettable roles in both film and television, Bruce McGill. I started acting officially on stage in a play when I was 11. And uh, at that time, I thought I might be an allergist because I had allergies and the allergist seemed like he had a great job because uh, his patients never died. They never got well. And he was every Wednesday he played golf. So I thought I'd like to do that. And my father was very happy with that. <laughs> then I decided uh, I got like a, a standing ovation for the, the leprechaun in Finian's Rainbow. And, you know, in, in the theater, you come out one at a time if you're a principal for your curtain call. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if they stand up when you go out, it's yours. And, and it's irresistible to a young person. Get ready to set sail with Bruce McGill where he shares fascinating personal stories with Crystal Symphony's cruise director as they sail from Tokyo to San Francisco. Through stage, screen, and television productions, we've all experienced the joy of escaping from our daily lives through the humor, intensity, even treachery of a well-played character. Behind the scenes of so many of these roles are hundreds of actors who put their life into their craft, passionately conveying the stories and characters for our enjoyment. Yet so few break into the business, and fewer still have the diversity and skill to inhabit so many different roles. Hi, I'm Russ Thomas Grieve, cruise director on board the Crystal Symphony, and I am joined today by a man who has played a wide range of memorable roles in both film and television, Bruce McGill. Bruce has appeared in dozens of television shows and movies, dating back to his iconic and memorable role as D-Day in the classic National Lampoon's Animal House. He has had the reoccurring role as Jack Dalton on MacGyver, as well as ongoing work with director Michael Mann in films such as Ali, The Insider, and Collateral. Most recently, Bruce had a reoccurring role in the television show Suits and has been featured in the 2019 films Palms and Best of Enemies. So welcome to the Crystal Storytellers podcast, Mr. Bruce McGill. Thank you, Ross. Oh, what, too formal for you? <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. McGill is like my father, who's okay. long gone. So, Bruce. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I have, uh, just for our listeners, I have been talking to Bruce and Gloria, his lovely wife, uh, since they've joined us here on board the Crystal Symphony. And I know this is going to be a really fascinating and fun talk for the guests. Yeah, it'd be cool. She's right over there. I know she is in the <laughs> studio with us. So we got to make sure we mind our P's and Q's while she's here. So let's get right to it. I find it interesting that we are doing this talk on June 6th, which is D-Day, which was your character in National Anthem. Very Anthony. good. Yeah, I uh, just didn't, I was, I was so intrigued that that happened on this day. That's funny. I never Yeah. Knew. Daniel, I, it, Daniel Simpson Day, nicknamed D-Day in Animal House. There you go. Did you think that that character would launch you into the career you had? Um, didn't really think much about what it would do for me. I was mainly a theater guy at the time and uh, didn't know. We all knew, people always said, did you know it was going to be such a big hit? Of course not. We knew it was funny, though. We knew it was really funny. And I read the script. I was doing Shakespeare in the Park at the time in New York City. And I read that script standing in line in the unemployment office at 90th and Broadway, New York City. And, Mm. you you know, usually the unemployment office, there's not a lot of laughs there. You know, (laughs) you're glad you're going to get a check. But it's not the funnest place in the world. And I'm reading this script, and I am laughing aloud in the unemployment office. People are going... He must be on something. I was. I was on Animal House. It was, it was, uh, you have to understand, it, that was 1977 that we shot it. And there was nothing like that, especially not coming out of Universal Studios, which at the time was narrow-tied black suit detectives mm-hmm. and some westerns. And this it was a very poor relation at Universal. They, the brass, hated it. The head of the studio hated it. They didn't want to do it. They thought it was you know, below their dignity and all that sort of stuff. And so the the uh, actively involved producers, the studio guy on it was Sean Daniel, and uh, John Landis was involved. And and they, they had to put up with a lot of abuse, really. And even after the thing came out and was a huge success, mm-hmm. it was only begrudgingly accepted. And it was a huge success. At that time, ticket prices, I think, were in New York, where I lived, about $4 for a ticket. And it was the first comedy to make $100 million at the box office at $4 tickets. So that's st- stunning. And even then, they were like, well, I don't know, it's kind of tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> so do you ever go back and watch uh, that movie? Well, last year was the 40th anniversary of the right. release of it. And uh, I didn't go to all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but there were celebrations of that 
at, at uh, you know, every city of any size now has a film commission or a film festival or something. And so all across the country, we were invited to celebrate Animal House because there's still people that watch it like like people play records mm -hmm. over and over and over. So, uh, yes, we did see it several times. And to see it again on a big screen, you know, not on an airplane or not in your own house, on a big screen with an absolutely full house in big theaters. We watched it. Uh, San Francisco was a big theater. Dallas, it was a big theater. Full and full of people that they know what they're going to go see. And they're still laughing almost like they did when it was brand new. I mean, that was a revelation when the film was pre-release, when it was uh, sneak previews. Mm -hmm. uh, I was living in New York City and the the publisher of, of uh, Lampoon, who's also producer of the movie, and he picked up Hoover, Jamie Widows and I, in a limo in Midtown and took us out. We said, we're going to go see it at uh, where the real people are. And I think it was Syosset, uh, middle of Long Island. And so we don't know now how it's going to play for an audience, but we got in there and it was People were literally, the first time in my life I ever saw a guy roll in the aisle. He was laughing and he rolled in the aisle, sitting like three rows in front of me. And myself and the producer and Jamie Widows go, whoa, we got something here. And uh, you know, but by then you knew, okay, this is really going to be something else. And then when it, when it weaves its way into the social fabric of the country as it has, and there are references to it in, in you know, Every year I read a film that references Animal House when they're reviewing another film or the history of cinema, whatever. So to quote the movie, it's something that never looks bad on your permanent record, Chip. <laughs> and I don't mean to call you Chip. It was, it was, it was, and the names, too. Chip Diller, Greg Marmalard for the bad guys. I mean, we had great names, too. Bluto, D-Day, Pinto, yeah. Flounder. But wow. uh, Chip Diller and Greg Marmalard and Dean Wormer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's been a film since then that, uh, you know, has sort of uh, rivaled that? Uh, they try, and uh -huh. uh, I'm trying to think now of, uh, I don't really know, because it was, the thing about it is it, it it broke that tight mold that made it not a favorite of the brass at Universal. Sure. So it opened the way for a lot of films, and a lot of, immediately after it, there were those Porky's films and things like that, and Meatballs even, a film that uh, Bill Murray starred in, was directed by Ivan Reitman, mm -hmm. his first uh, legit directing job, and that was a direct, that door was opened by the success of Animal House. So uh, I, I think there's American some, Pie. yeah, but you know that was sort of the sort of a one note you know, yeah. post pubescent thing. <laughs> this was really when you think about it, you could look at Animal House as uh, it was the anti-war and the war guys. Mm -hmm. But when you think of the the parade at the end, and the guy, the, the the people that wrote it were very very smart, very well educated guys, and uh, even though it's silly broad comedy, they were they were they were big themes, and it's a classical form. It's Good guys, bad guys. Good guys are down and out, and good guys recover and and are triumphant. So it's a, it's a, as old as the Greeks, you know. It's a it's a classical form, but it was uh, we were saying and doing things that weren't properly done at right. that time. <laughs> Didn't they do that in sort of the the beach blanket uh, bingo movies where they had the good surfer boys against the oh, motorcycle? Oh yes, that's what plane. I mean by it's a classical yeah, form. Yeah, exactly. But if you go back and look at those, they were like they were as pure as the driven snow mm -hmm. compared to the... Oh, I mean, absolutely. there were things in Animal House I forgot about, and I went to a screening in my hometown with my then 90-something-year-old grandmother who would, would sing from the Bible. <laughs> and I forgot about the uh, sexual aid in one mm -hmm. scene because I wasn't in that scene. And when they opened that briefcase and pulled out what they called the Coney Island wife tamer and things like that, <laughs> I barely could breathe. I could not breathe. And I forgot about it. And there, there was my grandmother. And the rest of the movie, it's only, you know, an hour and a half movie, which I love. I love a good, you know, under two hour movie. Right. And I didn't know what she was thinking about it. And so finally it was over. And I was like squirming. I was I was embarrassed. And so I said, as we walked up the, <laughs> walked up the aisle, I said, well, grandmother, what did you think? Well, I thought it was cute. <laughs> I said, okay, we're okay. But, oh, you know, oh, there, there was, I mean, it was really, for the time, racing. Now it's right. nothing. Yeah. Language, nothing. I mean, now, the, now it's, everything's out the window. There's no, there is no morality of language or, or what you can do anymore. Yeah, it's different, different times. You talked about being, or doing Shakespeare, shall I say, uh, early on there when you, when we chatted. And uh, you uh, studied classically. I did. 
did you really think that that's the way that your career would go, or did you think, oh, um, comedy is inside of me, and this is what well, I, I did. Do. I did the, uh, you know, I did comedies too. I mean, I did classical. I was, I, had a, I have a bachelor of fine arts in acting from mm -hmm. the University of Texas at Austin, which at the time was a, a very near professional caliber school, and uh, I did, you know. Fado farces. I did a flea in her ear, the double role. So I had been exposed to comedy at Midsummer Night's Dream. Shakespeare wrote some pretty good comedies as well. Mm -hmm. And also, one of the things that I learned about the playing of Shakespeare is Shakespeare was writing. He wasn't writing classics. He was writing because he was a theater owner and he needed to fill the theater. And in the Elizabethan era, they didn't want reruns. So he, the, he there's a big argument. Did Shakespeare really write Shakespeare's plays? Absolutely, because he owned the theater and he was he needed to fill the seats. And the other thing that the, the intellectuals argue about is, did Shakespeare write his plays to be read or to be performed? Same answer. He owned the theater. He had to sell tickets. So I could have that argument with anybody, wherever they went to school, Oxford and, and England and Cambridge all included. I will have that argument that, mm -hmm. yes, they were written to be performed, and, and yes, he wrote them all. A little lecture on history of theater there. Well, it's what I believe. You want to go, Ben? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll you back down. You want to go? <laughs> Were your parents encouraging? Uh, one was. One was horrified. Oh. Uh, actually, my mother was a painter, and very uh, her her bent was artistic. And my father was a World War II veteran and a, a child who grew up on a dirt poor farm in the Depression in Central Florida. Mm -hmm. And he he from the time I could talk was teaching me the value of a dollar. He had me read the sections in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I couldn't even read now with a magnifier. The print was so small. He had me read communism, socialism, and fascism. So he was a very nuts and bolts. He was a, he was a, a kind of a hard, very fair, but a hard guy. And all he was trying to do was equip me to live in what he knew uh, correctly. It was a very competitive world before right. I was going to be an actor. And my mother was... Well, let's see, to a fault, she was, oh, it's wonderful. You're so wonderful to all anyone she loves. They're wonderful, which is a disservice to people who don't have the chops and don't have the talent to encourage them too much to go into what, what is a very, to quote my father, when he finally realized I was going to do this professionally, which I decided at age 14. I started acting officially on stage in a play when I was 11. And uh, at that time, I thought I might be an allergist because I had allergies, and the allergist seemed like he had a great job because uh, his patients never died, they never got well, and he was every Wednesday he played golf. So I thought, I'd like to do that, and my father was very happy with that. Then I decided, um, I got like a, a standing ovation for the, the Leprechaun and Finian's Rainbow. And, you know, in, in the theater, you come out one at a time if you're a principal for your curtain call. Mm -hmm. And so you know if they stand up when you go out, it's yours. And, and it's irresistible to a young person, anybody really, but when you're young, you're hungry for some sort of positive reinforcement. And in Texas, where I grew up, most of that came to kids through sports. Right. But um, I was getting it, getting it from, you know, Finian's Rainbow playing the Leprechaun. And, and so after that play, I decided, no, nope, I'm going to be an actor. And my father was so sorry that I wasn't going to be an allergist for my good reason. <laughs> and, uh, but my mother was encouraging, and I played the piano at the time, so she'd been driving me to piano, you know, piano lessons since I was six or something like that. So she was always on board and always um, supportive. And finally, he realized I was going to try it. And with uh, somewhat of a heavy heart, I must say, he said, well, all right, I understand you're going to do this. And I, I don't have any moral objection to you being an actor. It just seems to me to be the most precarious profession on the face of the earth direct quote from my father. It was not wrong. It is, and it has been. But he also equipped me, when I said earlier, uh, he was bound and determined to teach me the value of a dollar. He instilled in me very early on a simple concept, live beneath your means, save that money, and invest it. And I mean, I mean, I, did, I was trying to do this when I didn't have any money, because you know, in the theater, you don't, especially in Shakespeare, you don't make any money at all. And it's expensive to live in New York City. So this thing was, it's, it's Benjamin Graham, who is Warren Buffett's mentor. Live beneath your means, save, and invest the difference. And uh, so I, I thought, how in the world, when you don't make anything, can you do this? And, uh, but little by little, I started to do it, even at a tiny, tiny level. And you start to see any positive returns and the other thing he would say was, just remember, Bruce, he was gruff. Just remember, Bruce, there's two ways 
to make money. Bruce McGill works for his money, and Bruce McGill's money works for his money. Mm. And these things were easy to remember, hard to implement. As I said, when you're when you're starting out, there is no money. There is no, you know you you just hope you have enough to pay your por- your portion of the rent on the shared apartment with the other knuckleheads who are trying to be actors. <laughs> so now that's now we're going back many many years, and that has made. I won't say all the difference in my quality of life, but a huge, huge difference. Because as soon as I got some positive returns, saving became very easy because that little bit of extra cash was my toolbox that I could work with. And I could work these, to me, they call it the miracle of compounding. Mm-hmm. But you know, leaving money invested, even at, at uh, what seems to be ridiculously low rates that we have now, uh, it gets your attention when it becomes positive. And you're not doing anything but sleeping in that chain. There's a few cents more in your account. And then it becomes a fantastic, for me anyway, creative exercise when you're not working as an actor, your chosen profession. And nobody works all the time. It appears to people that I work all the time, but it's not true. I mean, here I am. I mean, I'm, I'm doing some presentations <laughs> on Crystal, but I'm not working really. And uh, so when I wasn't working, a lot of actors myself included, in the downtime, you run the risk of a, a really terrible sense of, of self-loathing. I'm worthless. I'm not worth anything. What was I doing? I mean, I don't have a job every day. I, my money's going out. My money's not coming in. But if you were directly involved in putting what little money you've saved early on at risk, you better believe you've got something important to do every single day. Not only that, nothing that you can learn about the world you live in is not useful. It's all useful in terms of making decisions about where you might put money at risk. You know, a lot of my friends in my business are anti-capitalist. They regret it now at, at our current ages, but they, they give me a, a lot of grief about uh, being, you know, careful with money. Mm-hmm. They, they use different words, you know. <laughs> I don't know. We're probably, you could cut it out, but yeah. tight, tight, well, tight, you know, just, uh, you know, cut loose, man. Come on, let's go. I said, no, nah, nah, maybe after payday. <laughs> and, and see, a lot of the guys I would work with, they would go out and splurge the day they get the check. I would go out and splurge right before the next check if there was anything left. Right. And and anyway, the, the, the difference, besides, you know, I'm comfortable now, it enabled me to pick and choose what I might do work-wise. I was, as you pointed out, classically trained, and I came up doing... I mean, the thing about a play that's been around and being performed a lot for 400 years, you're pretty sure the material is good. So if the production's not working, it ain't the play's fault. It's your fault. And I did, when I first moved to New York City, I did Shakespeare and new plays at the public theater. And sometimes these new plays were just not very good. And the audience always tells you. And and if it's uh, Romeo and Juliet or if it's Hamlet or if it's... Those plays are good. So if you can't make them work, it's your problem. It's right. your fault. I do want to ask you one question. That is, did your dad see your success? He saw a good bit of it. and he, I wish he'd lived to see The Legend of Bagger Vance because he was mm-hmm. an avid golfer. And, uh, I, you know, if there is any regret, I regret that he didn't see that. But he did, uh, he, he lived to come to New York and bring mm-hmm. my mother to see my, my Broadway premiere, my uh, debut in My One and Only, my one and Tommy only. Tune in Twiggy, mm-hmm. early 1980s. So he saw that. And, you know, he was a, tap dance musical with a lot of colorful outfits and I don't know if it was his taste but my mother was so thrilled and he loved my mother so he 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 did live to see that much and he also lived to see that that I didn't I wasn't going to be hitting him up for money all the time because I was uh, you know it, well he, I, I don't remember my exact financial situation when he was still alive but I was making it you know I was making it and I didn't need to go uh, hey I got need some money I, I never ever ever had to ask him or them for money. I did once have to sell a guitar to make rent, but it was a guitar I didn't like very much anyway. And I, <laughs> and I, and I got 120 bucks for it, and I only needed like 80 bucks more to make rent. And that was just one month in my first New York apartment. He would be very proud of his son today. Yes, he would. He, he would. would. And those make for great stories when you have to sell guitars and you know when you yeah. eat you know, cucumbers for dinner or whatever it is that Ket- is to ketchup survive. And, yeah. Ketchup and water was there good soup. There you go, ketchup and water. <laughs> uh, did you have a mentor or uh, somebody who motivated you? Oh, of you? course. I had yeah. very good fortune in terms of who was put in front of me. You know, I can, I'll can. i try to run it down quickly. The first was the first woman who 
looked at my little short fingers and said, okay, I'll try to teach him piano. That was when I was six. And I had, you look at my hands now, like Vienna sausages. And uh, so she taught me that was important. And then uh, in elementary school, I wasn't an actor. I, I narrated stuff at church and, and you know played my piano recitals. But Marianne Roth Lothringer was her name, and she was the choir teacher, music teacher at the elementary school in San Antonio, Texas. And she was directing the, they had a, a they would do a show every year. This was an operetta, Johnny Appleseed. And her Johnny Appleseed got bad grades, and his mother made him drop out of the extracurricular activity. His name was Fred C. Vine. <laughs> I can still see it on the, on the libretto. And so she said, well, you're going to be Johnny Appleseed. And in those days, it was pre- rebellion Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. So a teacher told you to do something. It was just like a parent, in my case, told me to do something. So she said, you're going to be Johnny Appleseed. And I said, okay. And she taught me the songs. And we had like about two weeks before the opening. And uh, then we did the show and I was you know, positively reinforced, if I can recapitulate that. And then I said, this is pretty good. And I was not really looking forward to I love to play football with my buddies in October in Texas, but to go to the field house and suit up with those animals they raised to play football in Texas in August, <laughs> not so much. So I thought, well, I'll do this. Maybe and I won't have to play football. And I did every single play that came along. And plus in Texas, we have interscholastic league competitions. Texas is very competitive. You compete at football, you compete at sports, all sports, and you compete at acting. And uh, at one of these acting competitions, uh, it was a traumatic interp or some, I forget what they gave you trophies for, but somebody that was in there that went to another school said, uh, you should go to Incarnate Word College, which was a girls school in San Antonio, because there's a wonderful English actor there. He's going to be doing a year's artist in residency. His name is Ronald Ibs, and uh, they don't have any men in their student body. So if they want to do whole plays with men in them, they need them from the community. And I said, well, that sounds good. So, I, And I was already acting. I d did every play I could get my hands on from the age of 11 till this time, which was, I guess I was 15 or 16. And his name, Ronald Ibs, terrific actor. Still, all the greats that I've worked with, there was nobody better than he was. But he'd been in England, and he'd gotten a respiratory ailment. And his doctor said, you need to get out of London. And he came to San Antonio, Texas, warm climate, where his wife was doing a year's artisan residency. Maureen Halligan, another fa fabulous creature. So he started me on the Shakespeare Road. And we did a production of Othello. I played Rodrigo to his Iago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to see up close and personal a, a really, really good Shakespearean actor. And a good Shakespearean actor doesn't talk like this anymore. <laughs> unless he's doing a you know send-up. Uh, it's just they make that speech live. So he gave me um, a good head start. And then when I got to the University of Texas, where I have my degree from, there was a fabulous, fabulous, again, good fortune teacher who had been in the professional theater and uh, then in the educational theater, you, you know, produced and directed on Broadway. Mm -hmm. His name was B. Iden Payne, towering figure in the theater at the turn of the century. 1905, he was thrown out of the Abbey Theater in Dublin for being too progressive. They thought his ideas were too... 1905. I worked with him. He was 95 years old and 96 years old. He'd gotten too old to teach his, his regular classes. He would fall asleep in his own lectures. And I'll talk about this in, one, in my second presentation here. Right. But uh, if I hadn't had the time with Ronald Ibs, I don't think I would have been far enough along with just handling the language of Shakespeare like someone would talk. I don't think that he would have taken me on because he only did one-on-one -on -one tutorials. And you first had to have the courage to approach him. Uh, he was scary, man. He had bad English dentistry and <laughs> translucent <laughs> eyes and his skin looked like you could see through it. So it took some, you know, from a chutzpah right. to knock on the door. He took me on and we worked for one week, one day a week for an hour for my junior and senior year. And that gave me a super head start on all the professional actors of my age that, were, that wanted to do Shakespeare. And ever since I read about Shakespeare in the Park, which was, I was, I was probably 16 when it started, Joe Papp started yes. in New York City, and I said, uh, I, I would like to do that. Here's my goal. I want to be on stage in the Delacorte Theater, Shakespeare in the Park, with lines by the time I'm 25 years old. 
that was the goal that I formed when I was 17, 16, 17, 18, something like that. It happened. And that would not have happened without the first guy and then the second guy. So, yeah, I think you could call those mentors. And then, of course, every really great director you work with. And I now I'm mostly a film and television guy yeah, for a lot of reasons. It's just uh, the eight shows a week thing. It's tough. And the living in New York. I mean, compared to, I was just having breakfast on the stern of the ship. And it is gorgeous here, folks. It, we've had many days of fog and damp and cold and today is i mean spectacular here in kodiak alaska and uh i'm thinking back to you know okay times square between matinee and night show or the stern of the crystal symphony <laughs> in kodiak yeah. on a beautiful oh, day yeah. and it's just you know it's just where i am in life and uh, i uh it's not just because of you can make more money in movies and television it's just become more interesting it's not the eight a week and i don't get me wrong i loved it and that you've, you've done it. I've done it. There's a real thrill. There's a family there. You you never wonder, you know, who you're going to see on Christmas because you got a show that day. You'll see all of them. So um, now my life is just much more varied and, and interesting to me now. Back then, I was a theater guy, stage rat, blinders. But if there was a role, would you do eight a week for, for a certain role that you've always Probably, to do? but the last time I got an offer, it was a Sondheim show. And I was living in L.A., and uh, I was thrilled to get the offer. I auditioned. I sent tape. I sang. And and uh, then they came back with the offer. And I did the numbers, and it would have cost me money. They weren't helping with housing in New York. Wow. And uh, when you work in the movies, you know, you, if they're going to send you to New York to shoot, you're going to be in a nice place, and you're going to be paid per diem. They're going to pick you up at your door, take you to the set. And, uh, and I'll never forget when I did my one and only. I'd already done, you know, 20 movies or something like that. And... Uh, I got used to that world, and I went to, oh boy, Broadway, it's going to be fabulous. And uh, I go backstage when we finally move into the theater, the St. James Theater, wonderful 1,600-seat house on 44th Street. And there, instead of what we have in the movies called craft service, where there's coffee and tea and <laughs> food and candy and cookies and, you know, hard-boiled eggs and everything, here was a big, tall urn of hot water, instant coffee, tea bags, Lipton, I think it was, and a jar <laughs> that you had to put money in to get the hot water and the crappy instant coffee. So I don't know, that one would have, I ran the numbers and that would have cost me literally a couple of thousand a month to go do that. And it would take me, because it's a contract and you can't, you know, you can't go do a movie in the middle of doing your, no, you the first, first six months of a contract anyway. So, but you know, I don't. I try to. I can't imagine what it would be that would get me to do it. You know, I did a play in L.A. during the last writers' strike when there would be no work, mm -hmm. and uh, it was. I played Orson Welles in a film called Orson's Shadow. Very interesting at the Pasadena Playhouse, and uh, I, I'm, until I got, you know, we we had a short rehearsal period, and it was a big part, and I did, we didn't. I didn't get to what I considered playing for a paying audience sharpness until maybe five or six days in. But we open for a paying audience anyway, and I'm sitting there going, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Because, you know, you do a movie, and you prepare. I work hard. I'm a, I'm a, I am take pride in my preparation. Sure. And then uh, if I screw it up, even so, there's a take two. But when the curtain goes up in a, on a live show, as you know, what you see is what you get. Once they start, you do the whole thing. <laughs> That's it. And it was a good or it was bad or it was indifferent. Well, that takes me into my next question. Perfect. How do you prepare for a role? Um, research all the time. And uh, by the way, what I was saying about investing, about there's no single piece of knowledge you can gain anywhere in the world that's not useful to you as a, an investor. Same, it, it's useful to you as an actor. And uh, so I, I learn as much as I can learn all the time anyway. I like to read. It's interesting to me. And then when I get the part, I now that there's an internet, they don't do this as much as they used to. But used to, if you've got a, a, a fully budgeted movie, you get the part, you have a wardrobe fitting, and they send you a whack of research, especially if it's historic, like Lincoln or, or you know, things that are ripped from history. And you you learn everything you can about the time, the world, the 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 background of the character, and then the specific preparation is I I like to know my lines forwards, backwards, up, down, every which way. I, I study lines hard. And it's, it's harder the older you get. It's more difficult. But uh, 
I do that. And then the best preparation is don't drink too much the night before and get some sleep because our days are, are long. Yeah. And, you know, like a television series, every day was 12 hours. And because depending on how much money they have, it could be 18 hours. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing to say I'm working an 18-hour day. It's a very different thing to do it. I have a feeling you guys know something about that. I mean, it, you're not nonstop, but you're up before I can yeah. imagine it, and you're you're saying, "Yay, there's still a lot going on around the ship." <laughs> and uh, so, you know, because people in the in the regular world, most people have an eight hour day, maybe nine with lunch. And when you say an eighteen hour work day, um, they don't know what that feels like. Right? They they can intellectualize it, but so you know, good rest, good preparation, and then. When I step out, the most important thing in the between action and cut is to pay really close attention to the other actors in the scene. Because the scene doesn't exist in you. It doesn't exist in me. It lives out here where life is, in the space between us. And if there's three of us in the scene, I mean, I want to know what what everybody is doing, what they're saying, way more important than what I'm saying because I know what I'm saying. I don't know what they're going to say. And this is an interesting insight into working. I'm thinking now of a very specific director, Robert Redford, who directed The Legend of Bagger Vance. And Redford had a really interesting way of directing performance. I mean, he would do what he had to do with the camera and all that. That's the the sciences, the arts and sciences, you know. And when he would work with his actors, he would get so close to them and whisper in their ears so that nobody else could hear what he was saying to that actor. Mm. Barely, you know, if I'm the actor, I'm, I'm having to work to hear what he's saying to me. And the, the and I don't know if this was his, his real purpose in this, but if you want to know what he told a different actor, in the next take, you better pay very close attention. And it's entirely possible that that's what he was doing, that he knew that a good performance comes, a, a good scene comes from all the actors paying really close attention to what the other performers are doing. And if he, if he told me something, make an adjustment, change this or do this, and uh, and he, nobody else heard what he said, there's something about the human animal that's curious, that wants to know, what did he tell Bruce? Mm-hmm. What did he say to him? So they're, they're, they pay more attention. So uh, my point is, in, in, in the preparation before the day before or before you start shooting is one thing. And then once they say action, it's remember you know 100% who your guy is and what he wants, what he wants to accomplish, and then relax, be your guy, pay attention, and listen. So do you think the director talking to the other actor spiked your curiosity to keep you listening or to keep um, you aware of the scene of what was going on in the scene? Not so much me because that is a, a, a basic of how I work. Right. I'm always, because it, it, it takes the... Uh, onus of, gee, I hope I don't do it the same way every time, Mm -hmm. off of me, because everything that I'm going to do is predicated on what went before. Like, I don't answer your questions before you give them, part of why I didn't want to have the questions. Right. Because it makes it more immediate, makes it more interesting, makes me more interesting because I'm thinking. Right. And, uh, but but for other actors who tend to be all about themselves, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there are, there are some, they're, they're very self-involved and they're, and they're, they're, they tend to be more nervous actors. And nervous actors miss treasure all the time because they're self-involved. They're not looking out into... And the whole, you know, in a well-written screenplay, it's not all in any one character. It's it's in all the characters. And sometimes it's in a guy who's not even talking. But he may say something in a subsequent scene that he picked up in this scene. But you look for, look for treasure in the other actors. And uh, it's very important and it's... Uh, too rare, especially in television where you work very fast. Because, yeah. you know, really, and if you're just getting the script a couple of days before you start shooting it and you shoot out of order, it's difficult to do that. It's uh, because you're you're trying to remember your lines. And, and, and a guy like me, I, I want to know my stuff so well because inevitably, if I'm talking about a specific actor now, but she was wonderful, she was gifted, she was talented, she had a big workload, she was the star. She didn't know her stuff very well. And they started on my coverage. So by the time we got around to her coverage, she knew it because we'd done it several times. Right. And I'm happy to do that because I was never going to be at my youngest and most beautiful as pretty as she was. <laughs> and and she also is very talented. It's Angie Harmon from Rizzoli and I. Uh-huh. And uh, so I just, uh, it's much appreciated by everyone. And 
and it's something that I can do and I'm happy to do. And and it just makes because you're the real job there is how do you all make the whole better? What can you do to make it better? Not and there's some that think uh, they're not thinking what can I do to make it worse. They're just being selfish, and they become part of a problem, not part of the solution. And and I'm uh, a psychiatrist might tell you I'm way too eager to please that I should be a little more you know self self assertive and involved in my stuff, but it's not my way. It's not my nature. And and it's, this has worked out pretty well for fifty years. So, I'm sure the actors and actresses that have worked with you have really enjoyed working with you. They say they have, but I you know, actors. Sure. What are you, what is an actor? He's a card carrying liar. Well, that, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'm getting a nice uh, lecture or mm-hmm. a nice uh, uh, what's we're looking for tutorial uh, tutorial from you today. So it's it's great. You do voice acting. I do. So what are the differences and similarities between voice acting and screen acting? Well, the great thing about voiceover work is you don't have to consider how your hair looks that day or what you're wearing. Like, your podcast audience probably doesn't know this now, but right now I'm wearing a leopard print, skin-tight cat suit, very low cut. <laughs> and boy, does he <laughs> look stunning in it. The, 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 you know, to me, it's all the same. And when I do voice work, if it's not cartoon voice work, that's a different thing because you look at the the drawing they show you this is the guy you're going to be mm-hmm. but when i do voiceover work for a product or something it's uh working with the client and what they want and uh and uh sometimes they they don't really know what they want they'll they'll, they'll tell you uh, no we, we don't want this to be silly we want this to be very natural then you give a natural read and they go basically they tell you you've got to sell it a little more <laughs> and and they they don't like what you do when you're doing it uh, conversationally and then you, you do what you know they don't want, or they just said they don't want, and they go, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot of working with whoever's directing you in the booth. or And sometimes now it's done across the country. I'm in a studio in Los Angeles, and they may be in Washington, D.C. Or, or New York, and they're they're just getting the voice. And uh, then, you, then you consider, do you want mid-Atlantic speech? Do you want clear pronunciation? Do you want a, a rural anything from the South? Depends like if you're, you're selling Scott's Turf Builder down South or, or some kind of weed product, you might want a little of that in there. But if you're selling a, cli- a, a candidate, say, the running for governor of Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and there you want a general uh, acceptance and approval. You don't want to be too regional because you want as many voters as possible to vote for Charlie Baker, say, the governor of Massachusetts, who I did some stuff for. So you you know each each one is different, and uh, it's good mostly because you you're just using your voice and you don't have to consider the physical. So you can really focus on listening to what they want or what they think they want, and interpreting what they think they want, and maybe giving them what they really want that they didn't know they want. And then you get hired again and again by the same people because they know that you gave them what they didn't even know they really wanted on the nose. And that's a little bit of that's a little voice work for you right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I comprehend that one. Took me a moment. <laughs> Some heavy stuff, y'all. Um, you, your resume is extensive. I mean, it is very extensive. And do you prefer a weekly series versus a feature film, or vice versa? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to a no, weekly. No, I wish series. it was visual. His face. Went, uh. Okay. <laughs> um, I love to work, and uh, the, the reasons to take a job. When you're lucky enough to, to be your own patron, as I am, are, you know, of course, money. You always consider money because even if you don't think you need money, your agents will tell you it's respect. They have to pay you because it's the, it shows respect, the buyer, the producer, whatever. There's the role, most important to me now, the material, which includes the role. But it's the whole thing, too. Is, the, is this whole story going to be good? Or is this whole series, are these interesting people, is this an interesting world? Because a series is like, a, you hope, a never-ending second act. You start, the, you know, you yeah. introduce everybody in the first act, and, uh, and if you're talking about like a play, a three-act play, you want in a television series the never-ending second act, so you can run open-ended for a long time. So that that I like because if you, if you have a successful series like Rizzoli and Isles was, you have a really good job for a long time, and you get deeper and deeper into this character. And my character in Rizzoli and Isles got better and better and better for a number of reasons. Some writers like to write for my guy. Angie liked to work with me. And, uh, you know, and, and I was not a pain. None of those other elements like where it shoots, who's your guy, what's the whole story, 
Um, are they going to buy your wife a ticket to go with you to wherever you're shooting? All that aside, I prefer uh, the long form because if you're building, if you're building, if you're meticulously building a character, when you have a long form and a feature film like Lincoln or Matchstick Men or any of the good features by the great directors that I've been lucky enough to work with, you know from the beginning the shape of the thing. So you can build your performance. You, you know, depending on the role, there is usually one climactic scene. And you can't play every single scene in the movie at a climactic level or it's boring. You build to that chosen, carefully written, hopefully, climax. And then you build from it. You know, build, climax, denouement. It's classics, classical theater, classical writing. So I love that. I love being able to know what it is from start to finish. Not that it won't change a little, like uh, Lincoln, for example, which is uh, arguably one of the one of the top quality films I've ever been in. Um, Tony Kushner, Tony Award winning writer, great writer, great guy, is right there all day every day. So there can be changes. We can things can be tweaked, but it was carefully, carefully plotted and written and rewritten and rewritten by the time we start with it. So you know the shape anyway. I mean. There may be dialogue tweaks on the day, but the whole shape of the thing, you know when you take the job. So you can shape it. You can shape your performance and fit it into... Well, I know it, the movie was not called Stan. It was called Lincoln. So <laughs> I know that I am there to help tell the story of Abraham Lincoln in those few months. Wow. So from casting to uh, end of filming, uh, three months, something like that? What Lincoln was... was I think it was... Yeah, 12 weeks, I think, on and off. And, uh, well, you know, there were 147 speaking roles in that film. And uh, no, nobody was in it all the time except Daniel Day-Lewis, including Sally Field or, or uh, nobody, but Lincoln was in it all the time. So there was, you were in and out, and they, they will do, uh, there's a thing they do called drop and pick up. They can start you on salary with under the, the rules of the Screen Actors Guild, and then they can shoot for a couple of weeks and then drop you if they have a period of two weeks where you're not needed mm -hmm. and take you off salary and fly you home or whatever and, and then pick you up again, but they can only do it once. So in the case of Lincoln, they started me, they dropped me, and uh, it's kind of funny, actually. Um, I was Gloria was going to go with me back when we were, went to Richmond, Virginia, which I find very interesting, neat place. And uh, so I had shot Legend of Bagger Vance right down the road in Kiowa Island. So I thought, well, we'll, you know, we'll fly early go to Kiwa for a few days where they they treat me great they you know I had a great time there and then we'll go on up and I'll finish shooting Lincoln so a couple of days before the flight and I made all the arrangements in Kiwa Island near, near Charleston South Carolina and uh, then I get a call from the first AD producer Adam Summers and and he says um, it, you, you might not be getting on the plane on Wednesday he was English might not be getting on the plane on Wednesday I said, oh, he said, there had been a bit of a delay. And I said, oh, everything okay? Yeah, well, everything's fine, fine. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm taking my wife to Kiowa for a few days before that. I'll just fly myself to there. Uh, no, no. And I said, what's up, man? Was it, it, it could be some days before you work. And I went, did this have anything to do with the fact that Lincoln, Daniel Day-Lewis, doesn't think he can act after he's dead? So you can't, because I was in the final scene where Lincoln dies, and I, I have the, the famous line in history, now he belongs to the angels. So, and he said, um, something like that, yes. I went, wow, okay. So they, they had to put me back on salary and, and hold me for a couple of weeks while Daniel Day got, got through all of the living Lincoln so he could shoot his death scene. And, uh, and uh, Steven Spielberg, was such a great nurturer of, he is of his whole, of everybody, but he really was a nurturer of Daniel Day-Lewis. He took incredible care of Daniel Day-Lewis because it took him 10 years to get Daniel to accept this part. Mm -hmm. When he first approached him, Stephen bought the book immediately when it came out, when he read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, Team of Rivals. And he immediately wanted Daniel Day-Lewis to play it. And Daniel said, I, I can't, I can't do that. And uh, years go by and and Stephen really wants to do it, but Stephen's always got a lot of things boiling. He's you know, an extraordinary, the greatest filmmaker, I think. And uh, there was a time where you might get it going with Liam Neeson, 
And uh, then that didn't work out. And he always really wanted Daniel Day-Lewis. And finally, I think it's 10 years after he first approached him, he did again. And uh, Daniel thought, well, if I could just come up with the voice. Because now he's older, too. He's, mm-hmm. he's closer to the age that Lincoln was. And, and so Stephen said, I, I found this out in the press junkets when we were doing the, the PR for the film. Daniel Day-Lewis sent him a tape of his Lincoln voice. And, and it was incredible. And Stephen went, oh. and so then Daniel felt, yes, he could do it if he, if he had the voice. And, uh, and so there you go. It, and, and, and it got going. So he took such great care of, of Daniel, who has a, Daniel's got a process. And the, his mm-hmm. process is that he stays in character all day. He doesn't ever appear as Daniel Day-Lewis on the set. He is Abraham Lincoln from the time you meet him till not. And he's, he's got a, a hallway to his dressing room and he's got a separate makeup trailer and he doesn't deal with the 20th century or with people. Uh, and they don't, you don't get a manual that says this. You don't get a manual saying, uh, you just know that Daniel did, stays in character. So I'm thinking, okay, whatever. And I looked very different in my getup. Uh, so I figured, okay, I'll stay in character too. We'll just see what that's all about. And both of us had read Team of Rivals. Both of us had done the same research. And historically, Lincoln and Stanton were good friends. So, you know, there's a lot of downtime between shots. Well, they move the lights or, or whatever is being done, change the sizes, change lenses. So I started right away. I just started uh, talking to Abraham Lincoln as Stanton, Secretary Stanton, between takes. And Stephen came out one time. He said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, well, we're talking. He said, what are you talking about? I said, current events, 1864. Because we both knew them. And, and even to the extent that we could talk about family things. They had a lot of parallels in their lives. And so Stephen said, because he was coming to make sure I wasn't talking to Daniel Day-Lewis. I was talking to Abraham Lincoln. And, and then he said, oh, oh, that's good. He loves that. And, and, and then I understood, because I don't have the, I'm not the star that and it is, I guess I could try to do that. But it wouldn't fly the way it does with Daniel. And I realized one of the reasons he does it is it's much less exhausting because he's a pleasant fellow. And if someone comes and compliments him on a movie that he did, he's, he feels he has to be civil and it's exhausting. So this saves a lot of energy. He stays in character. He doesn't have to get in and out of character. But I'm here to tell you, if something funny happens on the set, he's in there. He's right there. Daniel's right there. And we there's a couple of funny things because I'm, I'm pretty relaxed on a movie set. And if there's something that's too funny to pass up, I might point it out. And I did. And he, I saw him bubbling up back there. But, you know, fine. I still I didn't blow his cover. We, we kept it. And, and I think if something funny happens on the set, you're probably the instigator, Mr. McGill. I'm sorry, Bruce. Once in a while. <laughs> Once in a while. I just I want to touch on something really quickly before we finish up here, and that is uh, we chatted a little bit uh, in the first uh, night when I first saw you here on board about uh, upcoming movies that you have right now in the can. Palms and uh, The Best of Enemies. Best of Enemies, Palms. But you did Palms with Diane Keaton because that one was for Mom. Yes, kind of. Yes, yeah. it was. It was, uh, my mother absolutely loved uh, Baby Boom, which is a movie Diane Keaton mm-hmm. did. She played a professional woman in New York who just fed up with it, and she ended up with this kid somehow. And so she's living off in the country, and she doesn't want to feed the, the baby. You know, she's reading cans, and it's all crap, so she makes a healthy baby food. And, of course, she's got this corporate mind, and she's very successful. And my mother loved it, watches it, watched it. She's gone now, but she watched it every time it was on. So when this came up, I mean, the quick pitch for for Palms is geriatric cheerleaders. wasn't the first thing that I grabbed onto. <laughs> but Diane Keaton and and my mother loved her so, and uh, I told her that too on the set. And, and she, by the way, is a lovely, lovely, gracious person, Diane. So yes, I I sort of did that for mom. But you know, I I love to work too. I just it's right. always interesting. It's always different. I mean, I won't do something that is terrible on the page, and this was not at all terrible on the page, and it's fun. It's a delightful, fun movie. So have you gotten to the point in your career where you still have to audition, or they call you? Uh, both, uh, but I, I will. I still do. I, it's been a while. I auditioned for Lincoln, and uh, and I, 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 you know, there's a there's an interesting argument about auditioning or not to audition when you've done as much as I've done. Uh, the agents want you not to audition. They would. They want you to have a meeting. If, if somebody like 
Steven Spielberg is, is willing to meet with you for 10 minutes of his very valuable time. They want you to do that, but they don't want you to read. And I always feel like, hey, I can do it. I'm a good actor. I, mm-hmm. I, I have a, you know, it's either me or it's not me, but I, I want to give it a shot. And I have, you know, I have won roles by reading and I have lost roles by reading. And their reasoning to not have you read is if you read it, you make specific that which in the buyer's mind is now general. I think Russ might might be good in this part, but if you come in, Russ, and you read, that's what you are. That's mm-hmm. that's the performance you'll give. It's just the performance you gave in that audition, but a lot of them don't think that way. So I understand the agent's point of view, but I also figure if I've done the work and I'm ready to do it and I've driven across L.A. for an hour to get here, I, I want to pull my guns and shoot. So I do, and sometimes it's very effective, and sometimes I don't get the part. And I don't know whether it's uh, who's right. I don't know, maybe if I refuse to read. I know if I refuse to read for Lincoln, I would not have gotten the part. And, uh-huh. and oh, by the way, I found out later, deep into production, that that uh, Daniel Day-Lewis had suggested I'd be right for that part. And probably what I was doing when I auditioned for Stephen was... Uh, obviously, Stephen has casting approval, mm-hmm. so he may take a suggestion from Daniel, but he's going to see the guy. And uh, so you never know where it's going to come from. And it's another thing, anybody out there that wants to be an actor, don't ever be a problem. It is not fun. It is not good. Those days are over. Even even so-called stars now, if they are a problem, they may finish that movie, but it's going to be tough to get the next one because the business knows and time is money. It's too valuable. And, and even if you're a bankable star, there's other ones. There's other ones that can do the part. And if you're an up-and-coming, a young actor, a struggling actor, as we all are at some times, uh, be part of the solution, not part of the problem, ever, 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 and treat every single person on that set with respect. That makes a huge difference. And I never ask for anything. I mean, I was, on Rizzoli and Isles, I had a, my own trailer, and they were always saying, can I get you something, can I get you something? And, you know, I was never a guy to say, when I've got, you know, a whole scene off, get me a Diet Coke, would you? I just never the one. And sometimes the craft service guy would, would come say, don't you want anything in your trailer? Like, now I realize, okay, this guy needs to do something for me. Yeah, could I get a flat of water in my trailer? Because usually at work now, it's coffee, tea, or water. I quit drinking Diet Cokes. And, and uh, you know, there's always stuff around. Uh, you can never have too much cold water in Los Angeles when you're talking for a living. <laughs> That's true. So, so be good to everybody, y'all. It's, uh, it's hard enough. Good advice. And, uh, all right, I just have a couple of quick fire questions before we uh, say goodbye here, okay? Let me fasten my belt. Uh, <laughs> oh, my, oh, my cat suit's so tight. <laughs> Still looking good. All right. Current favorite show? Current favorite show on television? Yeah. Oh, boy. It's probably a cooking channel show. I don't know what it would be. Uh, I don't watch a lot of network television. You watch the uh, Food Channel? Uh, I watch the Food Channel a lot. I watch golf a lot. Okay, so... Uh, I can't give anything a real hard pitch. Master Chef or anything like that? Uh, Chopped is fun. Chopped. I, I used to like the ones where you really learned something, like uh, Mario Batali's show was great to learn yeah. how to cook. He was really good. And, you know, I watch all of them. Uh, Chopped is good, and uh, Iron Chef is good because you see techniques you'll never do, but you get to see, you know, these masters at work. And I watch stuff like that, and I don't, I don't watch a whole lot of television. And in the, you know, in the... Uh, voting time for the academy because i resigned from the television academy mm. i was trying to make a statement didn't have any any <laughs> impact at all the statement was now with uh, all the streaming services and hbo and all these people producing stuff you can't watch it all it is impossible and if you can't watch at least most of it how can you give a fair vote and i just felt so conflicted and i i, I got somebody on the phone and i said i need to make a point here and they said oh yeah okay fine they don't care and not only that, I resign, meaning I don't have to pay my dues anymore. Right. I still get the screeners because it's a third-party contract, and it's easier just to send them. And maybe eventually they'll quit. That's great. But, you know, but it's just, I think, it, and I'm on the executive uh, committee of the Actors Branch of the Academy, mm-hmm. as uh, Dina was talking about. And it's changing so much because there's a similar problem there in that you can't see it all. And now the Academy is trying to be more global and inclusive. And they wanted to vote people in. What we do in the executive board of the actors' branch is decide who gets the invitation to join the academy. And you, you, you just haven't seen them. So how do you, how do you, do you just take Alfred Molina's word for it? 
because he's English, he knows a lot of these actors that I don't know. So it's a problem. It's a, we're all in transition because of streaming video and, and all the production. Changed the industry a lot, I think. Is in, is in the process of it. Um, strangest food you've ever eaten? Strangest food? Living sea urchin. Ooh. Yeah, it was weird. The spines are still wiggling. Ooh. Tasted like the sea. <laughs> like the sea? Oh, were you in a certain country? Other than uh, the no, I was in the U.S. Yeah. I was in uh, on a golf trip uh, with a business partner and friend of mine in San Diego. And he, I didn't order it, but he ordered it. He's one of these guys. Got anything really strange? <laughs> and uh, and it was, you know, I'm not a big uni uh, sea urchin mm-hmm. roll eater. But it was, it, was, it was kind of horrifying, but I tasted it. It was fine. Okay. It's fine, but uh, I wouldn't order it. You're I mean, here. You're still alive. No, yes, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Beatles or Rolling Stones? God, that's impossible. They're uh, A side, B side. I love the Rolling Stones. Uh, I love the Beatles. I love the, the as a musician, I love them. Mm-hmm. The harmonies, the, the, the melodies of the Beatles. And the best concert I ever saw were double secret uh, Rolling Stones concert at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. A friend of mine at my golf club is a uh, manages the Stones globally, mm-hmm. and uh, he's the CEO of the company that runs them. And uh, he said, can you keep a secret? I said, sure. He said, here you go. There are only 800 people at this concert. So we, my wife and I watched the Rolling Stones, and I know where to go. I go and stood right in front of the mixing board where the guy's mixing it. There they are. I mean, how far would you say it was 100 feet to Mick Jagger? Just right there. <laughs> And they were super loud, but it was so clean. My ears were, you know, wacky for a couple of days. But it wasn't painful to listen to somehow. It was just great. Oh, so, man. I don't know, Beatles long gone, Stones still rocking. If I had to ask, Stones. Stones. That's great. Movies or theater? Um, movies. Movies? Great theater. I love great theater. Like, a, when you... Something like Hamilton, I'm thinking about. That you can't have that anywhere but the theater. That's a pure theatrical experience, and that impacted me more than most movies. Mm-hmm. So, but it's so rare that one is that theatrical, and once it starts, it, it, you, you, you're just immersed in it, mm-hmm. and there's no time to judge it. Really, you're experiencing it. It's washing over you. So, I mean, that that's hard to beat. If I knew, you know, even 75 percent of the things I paid. 200 bucks a ticket for we're going to be like that I would I'd go more yeah. and also you know no offense to LA but having been on Broadway and seen shows in New York it's just usually because it lives there it's just usually a, a better production there I mean when they go on the road they don't they don't they can't carry all the same stuff and maybe it's just the, the fact that that's just the actor town that's the theater town I said if now you ask would I do a play I might do a play but I probably want to do it in New York because there's a real theater audience. In LA, the theater audience is, well, there's subscription audiences and stuff, and but the the business out there goes to the theater, maybe they send a junior agent to see if they can find an actor that, that they'd like to represent or something. Right. But, in, you know, New York, it's a real, it's a, it's a global destination to watch theater in English, as is London. You live in LA, but do you hold a place in New York as well, or do you just, no, when you go, no, you, I, you just... Visit? When I go now, I go for a job. Okay. And I, you know, I dovetail social, like uh, Gloria will come and stay, and as soon as it gets cold, she said, do you mind if I don't stay the whole time? <laughs> Truly. We were there, I was doing Shades of Blue with Jennifer Lopez, and I had this big chunk of time, and had negotiated a ticket for her to fly, and she comes, it was great, we were staying in this great place, and we're enjoying New York City, and then we go down to this street fair thing, and it's gotten cold, and it's windy, and she's, she's going, do you mind if I don't stay the whole time? <laughs> I said, sure, I, I'm fine with it. I have to stay, but you can go home. Oh, that's sweet. I was like to end with today or tomorrow. 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 Sure. Okay. Yeah, because today I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that you are a busy man, Bruce. I'm a busy man. It has been so great to have you here on the Crystal Symphony and to do this podcast. I want to thank you for all the listeners for just all the great performances you give, well, be it television, of. film, and uh, theater in the past. And uh, you know, and may you continue to uh, you know fill our living rooms and uh, you know the theater with well, great performances. After in the a couple of weeks on board, I'm filling them a little more. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And thank you very much. And thanks for all you do around the oh, ship. It's awesome. Pleasure. And it is. Here's a, my own commercial plug. The best experience in life. 
a ride on the Crystal Symphony or the Serenity. And if you're lucky enough to have your light, your wife love it as much as you love it, it's an awesome thing. It is an awesome thing. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate that. Thank you. So to all the listeners, um, keep tuning in because we have some other great interviews coming your way as well. So as I say, eat, drink, and be happy. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Crystal Storytellers. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. For more information about upcoming Crystal Sailings, please visit www.crystalcruises.com. See you next week when we are joined by General Anthony Zini, retired United States Marine Corps four-star general, former commander-in-chief for the United States Central Command, and former Special Envoy to Israel and the Palestinian Authority.